this is Valerie Aiello, and you are listening to Idea Diary. Thanks for coming back, y'all, and thanks for hanging out if you're actually out there. Super fun. Okay, so just got back from an actual coffee date at a real coffee shop, and looks like we're going to have a thunderstorm, so it was... Super nice temperature and great to sit outside. So I have hope that life is still happening out there in the world. So it's my first time to do, make plans and do something. So um, it was very exciting. The coffee shop, the inside of it was closed. But, you you know, there was just a line and then you ordered and you took it outside. And there are... It wasn't packed, packed, but it definitely, there's lots of people hanging out, having coffee dates. So, yeah, it was kind of, kind of awesome, kind of a little awesome thing to do today. So, I've got, I'm going to try to jump, squash this all into 15 minutes, but I finally, I read the book, y'all, this is a miracle, two books in one month, beginning to end. So this is Phyllis Stiller book, and this was uh, this book's called *The Lampshade in a Whorehouse: My Life in Comedy*. And this book is kind of a biography, autobiography, biography, autobiography. Yeah, um, yeah. So she's talking about she wanted this book to be a housewife kind of. Um, giving people hope and inspiration. It was supposed to be an inspirational book, but the guy who was helping her write this, you know, made the, you know, title it, the title that it was, and nobody wanted to put this on their coffee tables because it said whorehouse. And she was just overall unhappy with um, how the book was marketed. So it wasn't a huge hit, but the reason why... I wanted to read this book was because she taught, she always, if you go on YouTube and you look at Phyllis Diller interviews, she talks a lot about um, the magic of believing by Claude Bristol. And yeah, um, I wanted to see like her moments when she found the magic of believing and how that all went down. And I'm always curious, when was the moment that you stopped worrying about bills? Because I, f- I'm, I'm s- I feel like that's the question that everybody wants to know. When were you just a full-time creative doing whatever you want in your life? You know. Okay, so I've made notes. Not very organized ones, but let's do it. Okay, so she grew up. Or she was born in 1917, and she grew up, her parents, um, you know, had her learn classical piano, and she could sing, and she was one of those talented children. And when she, she got married to a guy that was, had a wealthy family, but it turned out that they had lost all their money, and they were just pretending to be wealthy. So, um, and all she wanted to be was have children and be a housewife and be happy, And um, that didn't really turn out well for her. So her husband was refused to work, or he just pretended to go to work. He just was not functional in any sort of way, but he thought that he was amazing, and he would do things like put on a suit to go hang out and read a paper in a coffee shop and pretend like he had worked all day long when he didn't. Um. When her parents died, she got an inheritance, I guess, and they were able to kind of float a little bit. Um, but when her the inheritance was all spent, they had to sell their house, and, um, you know, she couldn't go on pretending that she had a husband that was providing for her family. And... Um, So she decided she was just going to go to work for herself and basically let her husband be Mr. Mom. So um, she tried to get a job at an apricot cannery, and that didn't work. She tried to get a job as a waitress, and that didn't work. 
So she was looking for jobs. She got really depressed, and she had this college book of her memoirs in college, and she threw it into the fire because she wanted to forget about being smart and forget about being talented and just give up on trying. Um, But then she was looking in the paper for ads uh, for jobs, and she saw an ad for a copy boy. And it was for the San Francisco Chronicle. And so she went for the job. And when she was in the interview, the guy was like, well, this is for somebody that can't afford to go to college. It was an entry-level job. And for some reason, the guy thought, You're, this job isn't for you. You need something different. Um, you need a real job. So he sent her to this a small newspaper in San... Uh, Leandro? I don't know exactly. Um, but it was the newspaper he sent her to was just a few doors from her house. And um, when she went to interview for a job, she ended up getting it. And uh, she got $75 a week. And then she paid a maid to babysit for $25 a week because her husband wasn't able to even watch the kids, I guess. Anyway, so she took her $75 a week. She paid a maid $25 to be with the kids when she couldn't. And then um, that worked out, and she worked there. And then it, a time came when the they couldn't pay her the full $75 a week. Um, her boss wasn't really liking her. Something was going on. So then she decided to get a new job, and um, she tried to get a job as a as a music librarian at a newspaper, but she ended up getting a job in an advertising office at a department store. So that job was seventy five dollars a week again, and um, she was, I guess, writing ads for the department store. You know, they did it in house. Um, and she wrote newspaper ads and radio ads for them uh, as a writer. So, and that was when she worked at this department store. That's when somebody at work had had the book, um, The Magic of Believing. And um, she just started reading it and just taking it all in. And I guess the book really resonated with her. So then she ended up getting a job at a radio station for $100 a week. So she got a raise after she uh, started reading the book. And um, that was, okay, so I don't know exactly the age she was about then, but um, when she worked at this radio station, her husband, who was this huge loser and made her life so much harder, um, he was the one that kept telling her, you're so funny, you need to be a comedian. And a part of her kind of felt like um, he was the one that pushed her to be a comedian, but it was almost because he just saw her as a meal ticket. But he saw he saw the talent. He kept telling her she's so much more funny than all these other comedians. So um, at that point, she was 35. And in 1952, she actually tried to film a comedy special and for $70. She went, she just, I don't, but it ended up, the audio didn't sync with the film and they ended up having to scrap the video, the footage. So she just has no idea what, where that footage went, but she had got some help with some people that had a camera and she filmed something, but it, it was lost and it was just something for whatever reason she felt like she wanted to try that. So, um, in 1954, she was, um, hired away from the radio station to an ad agency. And then another, radio station found out that she had moved to this ad agency and um, she 
got a job there. And she's writing copy this whole time. And she worked at the radio station, and she made $5,000 a year, but she was still wearing secondhand clothing, um, still barely, you know, scraping by, but surviving. And she was reading the magic of believing every day. And she would highlight the parts that she wanted to read, and I guess she would ride the trains to work and uh, commute to work, and she'd read her that one book every single day. And then one night she went to a jazz club and she saw this female comedian and she just happened to, um, she was just really inspired and she happened to sit next to somebody that was a drama coach, kind of a comedian coach kind of guy. She just happened to sit next to the right person and he took her on as a client because she said she wanted to be a comedian, she writes her own stuff and um, yeah, at this point it was just a dream but she had met. Uh, a professional person that could kind of help her. So then she goes in and she quits her radio job. And um, I guess it was about two weeks or something. She got an audition for the comedy. There were, there were two comedy places in, in her city. And so the one that she got an audition at was called the Purple Onion. Um, but they said they auditioned her, but they said... You know, someone else was doing the spot right now, so she couldn't have uh, a gig at the moment. But the guy who had the spot that she could have ended up um, just last minute moving away. So they called her up because she was, they liked her and she had auditioned, and they called her up to see if she was available. And I think it was only like a couple weeks from quitting her job and her security and she did have a husband, but he did not work. She was the only breadwinner in the family. And she had six, five or six kids. And uh, it was pretty quickly that, like I said, two weeks or so, that she um, got a full-time paying gig as a comedian. And uh, before her, I guess when she had quit, um, before her professional debut, which was on March 7th, 1955, she was performing in psychiatric homes and church halls and women's clubs. She was practicing for free being a comedian as much as she could, but she, the 1955 was her first stage debut, professional debut as a comedian. And um, eventually... So between 1955 and 1958, um, she was basically touring and trying to get gigs where she could. Um, she was still poor. Um, and she was so poor that they had to send the kids to live with her husband's family in her husband's family was really poor and you know there's they the house that her husband's family lived in was small and there was roaches everywhere but they were homeless even basically they were homeless at this point and I guess living in hotels as she gigged around and so her smaller children some of her older children could live on their own um but the smaller children had to go live with uh, her mother-in-law. So um, in 1958, she got this big hotel gig. It's a big fancy hotel, and they flew her out. She did one show, and they fired her. And she thought that was supposed to be, like, her winning moment. Like, she's made it now. She could land this gig. However, they fired her after one set, and she had to fly back home with her tail between her legs, and she didn't even have the $60 to pay for their hotel rent for the week. I guess back then you would pay the week. And she had to ask her son, who was um, just working at a grocery store, sweeping, and he was trying to save money for his own college. She had to borrow the $60 or... 
I think she bar- maybe borrowed a little bit more money, but she had to borrow money from this her child. And that's how low it was. But um, between that being fired in 1958 to 1960, 1960 is when she started to make it. And she um, got a part in a movie, Splendor in the Grass, and she was on The Sullivan Show. She started to get on TV spots, doing her own comedy. And um, between that 1958 to 1960 time, she started to make uh, $2,000 a week at the at uh, the Purple Onion, and then she made $3,000 a week at the other club in her town for $3,000. And I think between that 58 and 60, she was just touring, and she was, uh, she met, she was opening places where Barbara Streisand was performing and getting start her start. Um, you know, she was meeting people. She was doing these exciting things. And so between... Not being able to borrow money from your young child who was just trying to start his life to being in movies and making thousands of dollars a week. There, that was that two-year period. And by 1962, she's making several thousand dollars a week and just killing it. Um, so I think... And that's when, you know, obviously she got um, TV shows. She was, you know, they were trying to make her um, equivalent to, like, Carol Burnett and stuff like that. Um, She had movie parts and friends with Bob Hope and all these people. Um, She ended up getting another husband who was kind of a bad husband. And, um, you know, as she got older, more famous, she could do these comedy shows and sell them out, and she ended up trying to be a a concert pianist, so there's, there are these shows where she's, you know, playing classical music and kind of combining a classical music symphony and her piano playing and kind of comedy all in one. She was really into the arts, and, um, then later she became a painter and had her painting in galleries and people bought her paintings for thousands of dollars, which I I feel like is something you can do when you're famous. Just might not you might not need to be the best painter in the world, but you've gained some notoriety, so it's fun for somebody to buy your paintings, whether they're good or bad. Um, not to say that she wasn't talented, it's just one of those things I think. Um, but it wasn't until 19, she was, uh, six, she was 68 years old when she fell in love with her soulmate and he was finally like a full functioning human being, very self-reliant, um, this lawyer guy who, um, just enjoyed her and, um, just the way he, she describes him was just very sweet and just kind of like the perfect guy for her they never got married though so it was like he would have his own house and she would have her own house and they would have like weekends together and um trade houses and then they both love throwing parties and just you know it took that long for her to really enjoy herself and fall in love so um but in between her she did have some point where she was just single and she did cheat on her husbands and while she was on tour and stuff like that. So it wasn't like she didn't have romances. She just didn't have a, a really great romance until she was 68 years old. And, uh, yeah, she was still doing – she did 125 club gigs in her 70s. Um, she was still doing movies and television. Um, I think she was almost – so she was born in 1917, and she died in 2012. And she was still, you can go see her on, if you Google or on YouTube, The Bold and the Beautiful, you can kind of see her. She's acting in this soap opera. 
She was in Bugs Life. Um, she was, you know, just in, she was still working up until the end. And she almost died once and they brought her back to life and she still went back to work and she was just, you know, nonstop creator. And, uh, yeah. So anyway, so I'm gonna wrap it up cause I've gone over 15 minutes. Sorry about that. Sorry. It's a long one, but, um, yeah, if you guys do any, um, research, Phil Stiller research and want to talk about it, let me know. And yeah, so her magic time was between, uh, 1958 and 1960. Uh, that looks like, and she's, started when was it she started truly trying to be a comedian when she was 35 and in 1958 um she would have been about 39 so 39 years old um she was borrowing money from her kid to pay the rent and you know so i'm guessing 42 she was high roller, high rolling comedian, making her every dream come true. She made every dream come true. And she says it's from the magic of believing. So I, I feel like I've listened to that book. I feel like uh, the audiobook is available for free through Hoopla. Um, so if you have a, you know, just check your, check your library, see if it's the audiobooks available for free to listen to. But that's it. I still don't know how to end the show, so I'm just going to play the music. <laughs>